We're in this uh, series called Rebel King and the second installment of this series, you guys. Last week we began it. And in this series, what we're doing is we're taking a look at Jesus' personality. Really, the, like the, the parts of Jesus' personality, I think that we overlook. Um, a lot of us, what we do unintentionally, they did it when Jesus, when he first came like on the scene thousands of years ago. They didn't think Jesus would come, the Messiah would come like he came. They thought he would look different and act different, and so they didn't receive him the way that they should have received him. And we're doing that today with Jesus. I really believe that a lot of us, a lot of people, um, the, the way that we see Jesus is this sterilized version of him. We see him the way we see the photographs and the pictures, and even when we read the Bible, we read the Bible and we read into uh, these scenarios with Jesus, the serious type. So every scenario Jesus is in and every interaction, it's like, we're thinking about serious Jesus. And there is so much more to Jesus' personality than serious Jesus. And the reason why this, this series is so powerful is, is because the, that God wants to have, he wants to have a personal relationship with you. Not, not, he wants to know you and be known by you. Not, not know about the Bible, know about church, and know, know about stuff, but know him personally. And so we talked about last week how in psychology, they, they define a personality. The, the personality is defined by like all of your attributes combined. It's the sum total of your physical, uh, mental, um, uh, emotional, and spiritual attributes. That equals your personality. So when, here's the kind of the big idea of the series. Let me kind of catch you up, and then we're going to get into contextualize this message today. Um, the big idea today is like, or for the series, is when we lose his personality, we lose Jesus. Like if we, like literally, if, if Jesus is, if we lose his personality, he becomes impersonal. It's impossible to have a personal relationship with Jesus if we don't know the personality of Jesus. And that's what I think this series is going to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help us relate to Jesus so much better, so much, so much different than maybe we have ever related to him before, because when you when you strip the personality of Jesus away, all that's left is like, is is it's dead religion. It's it's uh, the poison of religion. It's this box, uh, a frame. It's this picture of Jesus. It's this frame or figure of Jesus. When Jesus always intended to be our friends, you see, kn knowing Jesus, you guys, is all that matters. That that is that is all. That matters, not knowing about him, not knowing about the church, not even doing good things. All that matters is knowing Jesus. And just because you know about things doesn't mean you're closer to God. And Jesus, not, not in your notes, but we went over this last week, and I want to, again, contextualize this series or this, this message today with Matthew chapter 7. Jesus himself underscores the importance of knowing him. He says, because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, like on that day, the judgment day, when we're standing before God, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Because many will say to me on that day, they'll, they'll say I'm their Lord. They're, they're thinking that they have, they're a Christian. They're thinking they went to church, I belong to this. They looked the part because, man, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name we drive out demons, and in your name we perform many miracles. We did a lot of Christian things, and we were good people and all that, but all that, they, they missed the point. Jesus says, I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Knowing God, knowing Jesus is all that matters. So what we're going to do in this series is we're going to just, we're going to rediscover the lost aspects of Jesus' personality that a lot of us have, have either overlooked or because of religion or tradition or a perspective or whatever it is, we just have missed uh, this, this personality of, of Jesus. And we kind of sterilized him to a one-dimensional figure, and he is so much more. Can I get an amen? amen. So in part one last week, we, we kind of we discovered that you know, Jesus isn't always you know, serious and, and sterile all the time. Like Jesus can be playful. And actually, in the scriptures, we can, we can see it when we don't filter him with our own perspective of always serious. We can see that, man, that Jesus can be playful, that Jesus has fun. So today, I want us to look at another personality trait of Jesus that we strip him of that, that in, in, doing so, in doing so, it makes him unrelatable more than probably all the other personality traits we're going to study. 
And it's the, this is the kind of the big idea I want you to see today is that Jesus is human. Okay? Jesus is human. Now, yes, he's fully God and, and, and fully man. It's like the Nicene, the Nicene Creed says, very God, very man. He's fully God and fully man. He's both. He, and he's absolutely, he's fully God. No one here like that believes in God or believes in Jesus or is a part of discovery. Or even a lot of you would disagree. Like, yeah, he's, when he, all those heroic things prove it too that he does. All the miracles that he does. Man, he's, he's God. But then when Jesus has his, his human moments, can we call them? His human moments, all of us kind of, we look at that and we go, we feel as if Jesus is somehow cheating, right? Because like with a nod and a wink, we're like, yeah, we know what's really happening in here. Because that's, that's Jesus, you know? And we know what's really happening in here. Einstein showed up to second grade math to take a quiz. That's what's really going on here, okay? Our Mozart stepped into the kindergarten to play a, a measure of the kindergarten flute song. You know what I mean? That's what's, because he's Jesus. Oh, come on, this is a guy who he raised the dead. He performed miracles. He walked on water. He never broke a sweat, right? Yes, this, this is, he's, he's Jesus. Okay, this message today, you guys, I want to again call out the religious fog that will attempt to prevent you from embracing the real Jesus. Now listen, this is, this is why it's important. Because God has real power for you. He's got real peace. He's got real life for you. But it only comes by a real relationship with the real Jesus. Not the figure you've developed in your mind or because of your traditions or because of the religious fog that has stripped Jesus away from who Jesus really is. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to be tempted, and I told you this last week, and I'm going to tell it to you again today. You're going to be tempted to push back a little bit in this message, especially if you've been in church for a long time, and, and you've been around it for a long time. It just, it just comes with the, the nature. We become a little bit more religious. So, so it, it, my hope is this, and I'd like to ask you to do this for me. Just don't push back during this talk together, during this message. Just allow me to take you on a journey of looking at the scriptures, studying the scriptures, what God has to say about it. And at the end of this message, you can kind of, you know, make a determination then. But, but don't put up walls in the middle of this journey that we're going on. Because the religious fog is going to try to come in and say, oh, wait a, wait a second there. That's, that's, a, that's my Jesus. <laughs> this, is, this is almost disrespectful. This is heresy almost. You know, this is, so you got to be careful of the fog that will try to come and rob you of embracing the real Jesus. Let, let's look at some scriptures, just, just some theology here, a few scriptures. John chapter 1, verse 14, about Jesus being human. The Word became what? The Word became flesh. He actually put on flesh and, and bone. We know this. Not only did He come and take on our flesh, but Jesus came and took on our feelings. We're going to talk about that. He took on our flesh and our feelings and made His dwelling among us. Here's another one in Hebrews chapter 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Here's the truth about Jesus' humanity, you guys. Here's the big idea of today's message in your notes, you guys. That Jesus' humanity, he is humanity in its truest form. You see, the ravages of sin, um, just the, the neglect, the abuse, the thousands of addictions that we have endured over the centuries have left us a shell of who we were meant to be in God's image. Jesus is humanity in its truest form. His favorite title, Jesus' favorite title of himself was the Son of Man. Not of God, the Son of Man. But you might say, oh, but now, I mean, he is ascended and none of this even matters. Look, the world feels very comfortable pushing Jesus away, and we feel very comfortable of a Jesus and a God who exists somewhere up in heaven, but Jesus became flesh, took on our flesh and our feelings, and dwelt among us so that he could be close, not far away. Amen? This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. I actually talk about that. It says, when the time came, he, Jesus, he set aside all the privileges of deity, and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Jesus is what? He's human. Having become human, he, this is important, he stayed human. He didn't jump in and out of God, Jesus, human Jesus, depending on the scenario. 
right? Oh, uh, this, uh, this needs a miracle. I better put on my God Jesus. I better become God Jesus. And then oh, I'm just hanging out with the disciples, walking. I can be, I can be human Jesus now. No. It, the Bible says he, he stayed fully man. Like he never, this, I know it's like, a, it, this is one of those mysteries that we will never fully understand. How can he be fully God and never stop existing as fully God, but yet be fully man? We're told that he was fully man and never stopped being a man, never stopped being human. And then it says he died. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life. And then he died a selfless and obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. See, the more that we grasp the humanity of Jesus, we're, listen, we're going to find someone that we, can, that we can actually relate to. We're going to find someone who's not distant or far away or sterilized. We're going to find someone who's actually relatable. So I could have given you a lot of different, you know, scriptures about the humanity of Jesus and how we can actually relate to him, but let me give you some of them, just some of them today as it relates to today's message. Take some notes from you guys today. The humanity of Jesus, I want you to see it as we study the scriptures because number one, Jesus was distressed. He experienced, anyone ever experienced stress in his life? Anyone? anyone? Okay, Jesus knows what you're going through. He himself went through stress and was distressed. If you think Jesus was cheating as a God man, or that he was something, he never broke a sweat, then what, what do we make of Gethsemane? What do we make of the garden experience? Check it out, you guys. Mark chapter 14 and, and also Luke chapter 22 tells the same story. We'll combine them today. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here with me while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he said that he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Look, he's telling his disciples this. To the point of death. Jesus is saying, I am so anxious and stressed out and overwhelmed and consumed with so much sorrow. He's seen the cross before him. He's seen the pain. He's seen the beatings. He's going to be marred beyond recognition. And he is so distressed and overwhelmed by it that he is at the point, feels like he's going to die. I don't know if anyone has ever been there, been so stressed out, so anxious that you feel like you're at the end of your rope or you're literally going to die. This is human Jesus saying, I need some help here. And he tells him, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, fra Father, he cries out, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then he continues, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat, look at this, was like drops of blood falling to the ground. That's actually a scientific condition. It's called hematidrosis. It happens mostly with people that are in, in extreme anxiety and pressure that literally blood seeps through the pores. And it looks like sweat. Jesus is here d deeply distressed, overwhelmed with sorrow, anguish. Does that sound like someone who's cheating to you? He begs his father with tears that this awful cup would be taken from him. Here, here, here he's, he's, please, God, Father, let this cup pass from me. Listen, you guys, please hear this. He doesn't want to do it. Okay, now, I don't know if you've ever been there, like, because like, there's, there's a part of Jesus that does not want to do this. Can you sympathize with that? Where you know there's something you should do. You know like you should do it, but it's so hard. I don't want to go through that pain. I don't want to go through the process of that. I don't want to uncover that or admit that or do that. I know I should, but I don't want to do it. Jesus is experiencing the same thing. He doesn't want to do it. Jesus is, look, if this was, if this was fake, then Jesus deserves an Oscar for Gethsemane, doesn't he? Right? I mean, but this, Jesus is, he's human. He's real. Jesus was distressed. And not only that, Jesus was lonely. Anyone here ever experienced loneliness? Maybe abandonment or, or feel the, the, the sting of betrayal. Have you ever wondered why Jesus, after healing someone, would often tell them, don't go tell anybody. 
You ever wonder that? He actually did it a, a few times. In one occasion, in Mark chapter 1, after healing a leper, Jesus does the same thing. He sent him away at once with a strong warning. Like, why a strong warning? Like, isn't the point to get the word out, Jesus? Wouldn't a miracle be just the thing? To get the word out that the Messiah is here. A strong warning. Jesus explains why. See that. Go back for me real quick. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go, he says. Show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commands for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, look what he does. He went out and did the opposite. Him, you can sympathize without. Do the opposite of what God says, okay? He began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter. Look, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. He couldn't, even, he couldn't even go into the town anymore. The paparazzi are following him everywhere. Jesus is strong warning. Don't, please don't tell anybody about this. It, it, it shows his strong desire that he, he doesn't mind. Jesus doesn't mind going out into the mountainside and praying on a mountain, you know, for hours. But, you know, it's another thing entirely to never, ever have a bed or a hot meal and to live in the woods camping. You know, I can sympathize with Jesus here. I am not a camper, man. I'll go out in the woods. Let's look at the stars. But what I'm, you know, there's a good joint. There's some ribs. They, they got some good ribs in town. Can we forget your can of beans? Let's go get the, go get the ribs, man. Jesus is like, come, man, please don't tell anybody. I'd like a bed every now and then. I'd like a hot meal every now and then. And because of that, he's got to stay out in the woods because people still came to him. Even then, it says, from everywhere. From everywhere. Remember in Gethsemane that Jesus is, is, is such anguish and distress and overwhelming sorrow that he, he tells his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John. He says, look, I know this is mine to bear, but I can't, I don't want to do this alone. Would you guys come with me and just sit, just sit and pray. Just sit and pray with me. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to pray, but you please sit and pray with me. And what happens? He goes and prays. He comes back an hour later and they're sleeping. You know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if you, again, you can sympathize with Jesus here. Like, like you have people maybe in your life that you know they love you, but, but sometimes they just don't show up when you need them to show up. And it's not like you're going to discard them. Jesus didn't discard them or anything. He loves them and they love him. It's just, they're human. They're human and they failed him and people are going to fail you. And so Jesus, Jesus knows this. He's experienced this as, as, as a man, as human. He was lonely. Here's, a, here's another one. Jesus was tired and thirsty. Jesus had the same hungers and appetites and, and needs that we have. This is the man who unceasingly offered himself to others. He got tired and thirsty and hungry. Hey, listen, life affected Jesus. Is, does life ever affect you, you guys? Life affected Jesus. I mean, I didn't have room to put in your hand out or time to even kind of study this. But, and, but when John the Baptist, when he died, we were just studying John the Baptist here just, just a few weeks ago, you guys. When he died, Jesus' cousin, the Bible says, it's in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, if you guys want to go study it later. The Bible says that Jesus, when hearing, he got the report that his cousin, John the Baptist, died. He got in a boat and went off into a solitary place to grieve. I mean, life affected Jesus just like it affects you and me. One time, Jesus was traveling with his disciples in John chapter 4, verse 6, and it says, Wearied by his long journey. You ever get worn out by a long day's work? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah? Jesus was wearied by his long journey. He sat on the edge of Jacob's well, and he sent his disciples into the village to buy food, for it was already afternoon. And then, this is that woman at the well story, you guys know. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. We're going to study this scripture next week and a lot more, go deeper into this, and I'm really excited about it. But what I want you to see today is that Jesus was tired. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus uh, was hungry. Jesus' work in life wore him out. And if you, if you are thinking in your mind right now, kind of even starting to push back, yeah, but he's, he's not human now, right? He's resurrected Jesus. He's at the right hand of the Father in glory right now. You know what? The disciples were tempted to think the same thing about Jesus. On resurrection morning, that Sunday morning, you know those two 
those two guys we studied on the road to Emmaus yesterday, what happened is right after Jesus poof disappears, they go running back to the disciples in the upper room. And they start telling them like, oh my gosh, Jesus. And they start, he's, they start telling them the story. Look at this in Luke chapter 24. It's not in your notes, but I want you to see this. Because I know some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, yeah, but he's not. He's resurrected Jesus. He's glorified. He's like, he's at the right hand. of. The, he's the mysterious Jesus now. He's not human, Jesus. And so these, these guys on the road to Emmaus, it says, while they were still talking about this to, to the disciples, they were, they were saying, he disguised himself, man. And he, was, he walked the whole way, and all of a sudden it was Jesus, and then he vanished. It was so weird, guys. And they're, they're telling him the story. And then right when they're telling him, in the middle of it, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. The timing of this is perfect. I love this. I imagine that the timing of the, the, the guys, the road to Emmaus guys, the story, was right when they're probably saying, and then he disappeared. And then, boom, Jesus shows up. That's how I like to think of it. Jesus shows up right in the room, middle of the room, messing with them. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And then he said to him, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Hey, touch me and see. I'm not the, I'm not the mysterious Jesus. I'm not the, I'm not the mystical Jesus you think I am. I'm not the ghost. Does a ghost have, look, flesh and bones? This was so important for Jesus, for his disciples to see him this way. Hey, no, no, no. I need you to see this, guys. Go ahead and touch it. Go ahead. I, I'm, here, here's the point Jesus is making. Resurrected Jesus is still Jesus, a man. Scars and wounds and all. And then check this out. He says, see, I have them. But then look what happens. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And then still, while they still didn't believe it because they were so amazed and they had so much joy because they just, they were still thinking, oh my gosh, it's mystical Jesus raised from the dead. Oh my. Because of that, look what happens. Look what happens. Jesus tells them. Do you have anything to eat here? Look, you guys, you still, you're still not seeing this. Do you guys have anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it. Look at this. And he ate it, and he wants us to make sure, in their presence. I, 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 Jesus is going, look, I want you to look at my hands. Feel, I am flesh and bones. And they still weren't getting it, so he says, okay, let me eat some food in front of you. Give me that food. Me, nom, 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 nom. And swallow it down. I am, look, it, it, this, and before you, you start like pushing back in your mind and stuff, listen, please. This is how Jesus chose to reveal himself to us. Okay, this, this was his choice. His choice was to reveal himself to us as a man, as human, lonely and stressed and, and, and weary and tired and hungry and Flesh and bones. This was, just be careful you don't push the real Jesus away with your religious delicacies. Amen. And miss it. And miss it altogether. And miss knowing the real Jesus. This was so important to him that he took the time to pop up into a room and say, no, no, I need you guys to touch it because I need you to see me the way you can't. No, no, I, let, give me some food. Let me, I'm, I'm him. I'm the Jesus that walked with you and talked with you and took the scars and the, and the beating. Let me give you one more aspect of Jesus' humanity that is really important to understand. It's already up here. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus performed miracles. See, Jesus came to earth not just to take on the sins of humanity, right? Not, he, 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 he offered us redemption by the forgiveness of our sins, justifying us uh, giving, us, giving us access, eternal home in heaven forever. Jesus did that for us. And you can even say that was like his life mission. But it wasn't the only thing on Jesus' checklist to do. If it was, then he would have went directly to the cross. But no, it wasn't. I mean, why, why then did Jesus live his life? Why, why show us his humanity? Why, why reveal? Why show us his scar? Why perform the miracles and the signs and the wonders, listen, he came to reveal something else, something quite unexpected altogether, you guys. He came to reveal what one man could do 
rightly related to Father God. Okay. Because if, if Jesus did miracles as, a, as, as God, <laughs> wow, Jesus, you know, I'd still be amazed. But if Jesus did miracles as a man, now I am unsatisfied with my life. Now, because he alone is the only example. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. I'm not asking you to do something a human can't do. I'm not asking you to do so. I am asking you to follow me, and they will do even, look what he says, even greater things that I'm doing than these, because I am going, he says, to the Father. Look, Jesus Christ is God. He's eternally God. He never stopped being God. He never took a vacation from his divinity. He was always God, but his earthly life was equally natural. He was fully man. And if you embrace the humanity of Jesus, I, I, I believe that, that after today, if you take these to heart, you will relate to him differently forever, forever, when you embrace the human, the real Jesus let me give you some things that it's actually going to do. Four things, okay? Because of the humanity of Jesus, number one, I can approach Jesus. He's approachable now, this Jesus, because he's, he's kind of like me, knowing that Jesus was hungry and tired and lonely and stressed and experienced life, it makes him approachable. I don't know if you know anyone in your life that like is not approachable. Maybe they, they think they're perfect or they think they, they act like they don't have any problems. Religious people are really good at that. We're really good at putting on, especially in church like this. We come in here and we put on a religious face or a religious garb and we act like everything's okay when we're in the middle of a divorce. Or we act like everything's okay when I just lost my job. Or we act like everything's okay, but my, my children, it's a mess. Or, and we put on, I, look, people that, that act like everything is perfect, they're not, they're not approachable. If you have a boss like that, you're not going to pour out your heart to your boss and explain to him all your issues and your problems. No, but Jesus is approachable. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says, we don't have a high priest. Talking about Jesus as the one who make, he's making intercession for us. He's our high priest who cannot sympathize. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. Look at this. But was in all points tempted as we are. Like in, in every way, in every point that you could be tempted, Jesus experienced that temptation. In every point, whatever stress you're going through, whatever hurt, whatever challenge, whatever issue, whatever, whatever habit, whatever, whatever you're experiencing, Jesus can actually come alongside. He doesn't pretend that he's this godly mystical thing that you can't touch. He came alongside and said, touch it. Feel it. Give me some food. I'm hungry. Come sit down with me and pray with me because I feel like I'm going to die. He can relate to you. Why? So that you can approach him. So that you, yet, it says, he was without sin. He was without sin. Jesus, there's a, there's a myth that says that you need to clean up your act before you come to Jesus. You ever like felt that, heard that. Some of you maybe even are experiencing that. Oh, I can't come to God yet. I got to work on this. Let me fix this and then I'll come. No, that's not how it works. You don't fix yourself and come. You come with the good, the bad, and the ugly. He already knows it. He loves you anyway. He's experienced all the issues, challenges, habits, regrets, the shame. He knows all of it, has experienced it, can sympathize with it. You, you don't change yourself and then come. You come to God and he gives you the power to change. Because the humanity of Jesus, that he's not this distant, faraway God, he's close, he's approachable. I can approach Jesus. Because of the humanity of Jesus, not only that, I can know Jesus. I can, I can truly know him. I can know him. I mean, I want you to know Jesus, you guys, so, so bad. I want you to know him. Like, it's my heart's desire not to, not to give you a, just a great experience every week not to give you a great worship experience and and to just give you some great preaching and stuff like that although it is every week i know i'm kidding i'm kidding i kid i kid you guys didn't have to laugh so hard okay 
I, it's, not my, it's not my desire. My heart's desire is, is to, to lead you to, to know him more. That's all that matters. My, my desire for myself, my goal for me and for you, and I pray for you often, this prayer, that you would stand before God one day and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. To, to, not, to not stand before God and, and to, have, to have him say, who are you? I never, I never knew you my, that's my, I mean, I'm glad that, that you're going to fix up your life and become a better person and a more moral person and maybe get some tools to apply to make you more successful and better at your relationships and, and all that great stuff. But that's not the goal, man. And I'm glad that following Jesus and the teaching and the principles that can apply to your life and make it actually better. But my heart's desire is for you to know Jesus. And because of his humanity, I can truly know him. I just, I mean, if he's just this distant guy, I mean, he's so mysterious and mystical, can't really know him, but you can know this Jesus, the real Jesus. You can know. Paul's a great example of this. Paul is someone who, in the Bible, was he was a Pharisee. He called himself the, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, had, he was educated. He was intellectual. He, he had so much knowledge about God, but but at one point in his life, that was not enough. And, and every one of you here, if you know a lot about God, at some point, you're going to come to the end of that. And, and Paul needed to have an encounter with the real Jesus. And he, had, and he had one of his own, an encounter, an experience with the real Jesus. And it changed his life forever. His perspective on life and everything that he attained and all the success and all the knowledge and all the Bible and all the stuff about it just changed his life forever. Look, this is what he said in Philippians chapter three. But whatever were gains to me, Paul says, I now consider loss. All that stuff that I have, it's all loss for the sake of Christ. He says, what is more, I consider everything loss because of the surpassing worth of, look, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. He actually says, I consider them garbage. And that's a, that's a played down version, new international version word for the actual Greek word that is there. The actual Greek word that's used right there for garbage, I can't even say it in church, you guys. It's, he said, I consider them dung, manure, that word. If he was texting this, insert poo emoji right there. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, he said, I consider it all garbage, dung, worthless, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness, look at this, of my own that comes from all the things I know and all the things I do, and I'm a good person, and I get all from, from, from the law. No, but that, look what he says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes by God on the basis of this relationship of faith that I have with him. And then he says this, and he says no three times in this section. I want to know Christ. I just want to know Christ, Paul says. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering. He says becoming like him in his death. And so I love this, the Apostle Paul, very intellectual, smart guy, man. Somehow, he says, he's like, I don't understand it all. I don't get this whole fully God, fully man. Is it still, there's still a lot of things that you will never fully understand on this side of heaven, but we do not follow God based on our understanding or our intellect. We follow God on the basis of faith, Paul says. On faith, somehow attaining to this resurrection of the dead. Paul says, man, I know a lot, but I, I, just, I don't follow God based on what I know and my understanding because I don't understand it all. I follow God based on faith. I want to know God. Paul says, I know Jesus on the basis of faith. Because Jesus' humanity, I can approach him differently. He is relatable. And I pray after today that, you're, that you would approach Jesus differently from here on in your relationship to him. That you would actually know him personally. Not just know about him, but personally know him in your life. And then number three, because of the humanity of Jesus, I can follow Jesus. I mean, without the humanity of Jesus, I can't really follow him if he's like way up there. 
this God. I'm going to follow a God. Like, really? I mean, I can cheer him on. I can worship him. Oh, you're awesome, Jesus. Woo! Jesus, go, Jesus. Go, Jesus. We can do that. But I, I can't really follow. I can worship, but I can't. But to live like him? I mean, he's God. But then we get verses like this, Philippians chapter 2. In your lives, say my life. In your lives, you must think and act like Christ Jesus. You see, if, if Jesus is fully God and fully man, then we don't just follow him to heaven. Listen, we follow his example on earth. You see, if he's, if, he's, if, he's full, if he's just fully God, then I'm following him to where he is. I'm following him to heaven. But because he's fully God and fully man, I'm not just following God to a one-day eternal destiny in heaven. I can follow God now, his example now. Come on, somebody, amen? I can follow this Jesus, this real Jesus, not the figure we created not the sterilized, serious figure of the religious fog. Not the delicate Jesus, the real Jesus, who is hungry and thirsty and tired and stressed and knows me. Because of his humanity, I can follow Jesus. And then lastly, number four, I can, I can love this Jesus. I can love this Jesus. You see, I mean, how can I? If I don't know the real Jesus... How can I love Jesus? I know, I know that's like a philosophical statement and stuff. I mean, can't, but but if, if, if all we know is like the, this figure of Jesus that really isn't even him, it's just this like, it's a picture, it's a photo, it's, it's can, I really, can I really love Jesus without knowing Jesus? And if I don't approach Jesus, how can I, how can I love him? And if, I don't, if I'm not following Jesus' example, do I really love Jesus? Jesus was more human than humanity. I'm telling you, this is going to open up wonders for you in your relationship, how you relate to God personally. If you can get away from the, if you can step out of the religious fog and see Jesus for how he chose to be seen by us, human. Resurrected Jesus and all. Resurrected Jesus is still Jesus. Scarred and hungry, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. I love the Passion Translation. He understands humanity. Oh, I, want, I just want you to hear that today. Like, Jesus understands what you're going through, not because he knows all and he's like omniscient, that's the biblical word, that he knows all things, but like he understands personally. Not because intellectually, but personally. He's felt what you felt. He's hurt where you hurt. He understands humanity. For as a man, not as God, but as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way just as we are and conquered sin. And because of that, because he knows humanity and because Jesus was a man, look what, look what happens now. So now, because of that, we can come freely and boldly. I can approach this Jesus. This Jesus I can approach. That mystical figure that is just always serious and sterile, I, I'm afraid of that. There is fear where there is religion, but Jesus says, perfect love casts out all fear. You can approach this freely and boldly to where, look, love is enthroned there in the presence of the real Jesus to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. Hey, you may be here today. You may have been going to church or for a long time. Maybe you've known about Jesus for a long time. But you know something's missing. That maybe you've been caught in that fog of religion. That, that the Jesus that you are relating to or at least trying to relate to is stripped of all personality. 
And it's really hard to get personal with him. And maybe today, you need to start a real relationship with the real Jesus. See, God has so much to offer you. There's so much access that is opened up through this relationship, real relationship, personal, with the real Jesus. Jesus said, greater things when you follow me. See, Jesus took follow me, that, that, that invitation to follow me takes on a whole new meaning now, doesn't it? To come and follow me, not follow me to heaven, but follow my example on earth. Some of you here today, you've been in church for a long time, or at least around church for such a long time, and you need this. You need a real relationship. Some of you, maybe you haven't been around church, and maybe you didn't know this is what it was about. Maybe your perspective of church was more about the religious stuff or the do's and the don'ts. And you didn't know it was all about knowing. It was all about personally knowing him, that that's what really matters, and that's where change and transformation and power and life and peace actually come from knowing personally Jesus. Today, I want to invite you to begin a real relationship with the real Jesus. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes?